Hello, my name is Cal. Welcome to 100 Stories Deep. Today I'm going to be reading Bones of the Earth by Ursula Le Guin. It's a short story set in her fantasy world of Earthsea. I've chosen this story because for me it's really magical and really intimate and deals with pain and loss in a way that finds a lot of comfort and strength as well. So, I'll begin. The Bones of the Earth It was raining again and the wizard of Rayalbi was sorely tempted to make a weather spell. Just a little spell, a small spell, to send the rain on round the mountain. His bones ached. They ached for the sun to come out and shine through his flesh and dry them out. Of course, he could say a pain spell, but all that would do was hide the ache for a while. There was no cure for what ailed him. Old bones need the sun. The wizard stood still in the doorway of his house, between the dark room and the rain streaks open air preventing himself from making a spell and angry at himself for having to be prevented. He never swore, men of power do not swear, it is not safe, but he cleared his throat with a coughing growl, like a bear. A moment later a thunderclap rolled off the hidden upper slopes of Gaunt Mountain, echoing round from north to south, dying away in the cloud-filled forests. A good sign, thunder, Dolce thought. It would stop raining soon. He pulled up his hood and went out into the rain to feed the chickens. He checked the hen house, finding three eggs. Red Booker was setting. Her eggs were about due to hatch. The mites were bothering her and she looked scruffy and jaded. He said a few words against mites, told himself to remember to clean out the nest box as soon as the chicks hatched and went on to the poultry yard, where Brown Booker and Grey and Leggings and Candor and the King huddled under the eaves making soft, shrewish remarks about the rain. It will stop by midday, the wizard told the chickens. He fed them and squelched back to the house with three warm eggs. When he was a child, he had liked to walk in the mud. He remembered enjoying the cool of it rising between his toes. He still liked to go barefoot, but no longer enjoyed the mud. It was sticky stuff and he disliked stooping to clean his feet before going into the house. When he'd had a dirt floor, it hadn't mattered, but now he had a wooden floor, like a lord or a merchant or an archmaid. To keep the cold and damp out of his bones, not his own notion, silence had come up from Gaunt Port last spring to lay a floor in the old house. They had had one of their arguments about it. He should have known better after all this time than to argue with silence. I've walked on dirt for 75 years, Dolce said. A few more won't kill me. To which silence, of course, made no reply, letting him hear what he had said and feel its foolishness thoroughly. Dirt's easier to keep clean, he said, knowing the struggle already lost. It was true that all you had to do with a good hard packed clay floor was sweep it now and then and sprinkle it to keep the dust down. But it sounded silly all the same. Who's to lay this floor, he said, now merely querulous. Silence nodded, meaning himself. The boy was in fact a workman of the first order, carpenter, cabinet maker, stone layer, roofer. He had proved that when he lived up here as Dulce's student, and his life with the rich folk of Gaunt Port had not softened his hands. He brought the boards from Six Mill and Ray Albee driving Gamma's ox team. He laid the floor and polished it the next day, while the wizard was up at Bog Lake gathering samples. When Dolce came home, there it was, shining like a dark lake itself. I have to wash my feet every time I come in, he grumbled. He walked in gingerly, 
The wood was so smooth, it seemed soft to the bare soul. Satin, he said. You didn't do all that in one day without a spell or two. A village hut for a palace floor. Well, it'll be a sight come winter to see the fire shine in that. Or do I have to get me a carpet now, a golden fleece? Silence smiled. He was pleased with himself. He'd turned up on Dulce's doorstep a few years ago. Well, no, 20 years ago it must be. Or 25, a while ago now. He had been truly a boy then, long-legged, rough-haired, soft face, a set mouth and clear eyes. What do you want? the wizard asked, knowing what he wanted, what they all wanted, and keeping his eyes from those clear eyes. He was a good teacher, the best on Gunt, he knew that, but he was tired of teaching. He didn't want another apprentice underfoot, and he sensed danger. To learn, the boy whispered. Go to Roke, Dulce had said. The boy wore shoes and a good leather vest. He could afford to earn a ship's passage to the school. I've been there. At that, Dulce looked him over again. No cloak, no staff. Failed, sent away, ran away. The boy shook his head at each question. He shut his eyes. His mouth was already shut. He stood there intensely gathered, suffering, drew breath, looked straight into the wizard's eyes. My mastery is here. I'm guns, he said, still speaking hardly above a whisper. My master is Heleth. At that, the wizard, whose true name was Heleth, stood as still as he did, looking back at him, till the boy's gaze dropped. In silence, Dulce sought the boy's name and saw two things, a fur cone and the rune of the closed mouth. Then, seeking further, he heard in his mind a name spoken, but he did not speak it. I'm tired of teaching and talking, he said. I need silence. Is that enough for you? The boy nodded once. Then to me, you are silence, the wizard said. You can sleep in the nook under the west window. There's an old pallet in the wood house. Air it. Don't bring the mice in with it. And he stalked off towards the overfell, angry with the boy for coming and with himself for giving in. But it was not anger that made his heart pound. Striding along, he could stride then, with the sea wind pushing at him always from the left and the early sunlight out on the sea past the vast shadow of the mountain. He thought of the mages of Roke, the masters of the art magic, the professors of mystery and power. He was too much for him, was he? And he'll be too much for me, he thought and smiled. He was a peaceful man, but he did not mind a bit of danger. He stopped then and felt the dirt under his feet. He was barefoot as usual. When he was a student on Roke, he had worn shoes, but he had come back to Gunt, to Ray Alby, with his wizard staff and kicked off his shoes. He stood still and felt the dust and the rock of the cliff-top path under his feet, and the cliffs under that, and the roots of the island in the dark under that. In the dark under the waters, all islands touched and were one. So his teacher Ard had said, and so his teachers on Roke had said, but this was his island, his dirt, his rock. His wizardry grew out of it. My mastery is here, the boy had said, but it went deeper than mastery. That perhaps was something Dulce could teach him, what went deeper than mastery. What he had learned here on guns before he ever went to Roke. And the boy must have a staff. Why had Namel let him leave Roke without one, empty-handed, as apprentice or a witch? Power like that shouldn't go wandering about, unchanneled and unsignalled. My teacher had no staff, Dulce thought. And at the same moment, the boy wants a staff from me, 
Gontish oak from the hands of a Gontish wizard. Well, if he earns it, I'll make him one. If he can keep his mouth closed. And I'll leave him my law books. If he can clean out the hen house and understand the losses of Danamere and keep his mouth closed. The new student cleaned out the hen house and hoed the bean patch, learned the meaning of the glosses of Danamere and the arcana of the Enlardis and kept his mouth closed. He listened. He heard what Dulce said. Sometimes he heard what Dulce thought. He did what Dulce wanted and what Dulce did not know he wanted. His gift was far beyond Dulce's guidance. Yet he had been right to come to Ray Albi and they both knew it. Dulce thought sometimes in those years about sons and fathers. He had quarrelled with his own father, a sorcerer prospector, over his choice of Ard as a teacher. His father had shouted that a student of Ard's was no son of his, had nursed his rage and died unforgiving. Dulce had seen young men weep for joy at the birth of a first son. He had seen poor men pay witches a year's earnings for the promise of a healthy boy. And rich men touch his baby's face and whisper adoring, My immortality. He had seen men beat their sons, bully and humiliate them, spite and thwart them, hating the death they saw in them. He had seen the answering hatred in the son's eyes, the threat, the pitiless contempt, and seeing it, Dulce knew why he had never sought reconciliation with his father. He had seen a father and son work together from daybreak to sundown, the old man guiding a blind ox, the middle-aged man driving the iron-bladed plough, never a word spoken. As they started home, the old man laid his hand a moment on the son's shoulder. He always remembered that. He remembered it now, when he looked across the hearth, winter evenings, at the dark face bent over a law book or a shirt that needed mending, the eyes cast down, the mouth closed, the spirit listening. Once in a lifetime, if he is lucky, a wizard finds somebody he can talk to. Namel had said that to Dulce a night or two before Dulce left Roke, a year or two before Dulce was chosen Archmage. He had been the master patterner and the kindest of all of Dulce's teachers at the school. I think if you stayed, Haleth, we could talk. Dulce had been unable to answer at all for a while, then stammering, guilty at his ingratitude and incredulous at his obstinacy. Master, I would stay, but my work is on Gaunt. I wish it was here with you. It's a rare gift to know where you need to be before you've been to all the places you don't need to be. Well, send me a student now and then. Roke needs Guntish wizardry. I think we're leaving things out here, things worth knowing. Dulce had sent students onto the school, three or four of them, nice lads with a gift for this or that, but the one the male had waited for had come and gone of his own will, and what they thought of him on Roke, Dulce did not know, and silence of course did not say. It was evident that he had learned there in two or three years what some boys learn in six or seven and many never learned at all. To him it had been mere groundwork. Why didn't you come to me first? Dulce had demanded. <clears throat> and then go to Rope to put a polish on it. I didn't want to waste your time. Did Namel know you were coming to work with me? Silence shook his head. If you'd deigned to tell him your intentions, he might have sent a message to me. Silence looked stricken. Was he your friend? Dulce paused. He was my master. Would have been my friend, perhaps, if I'd stayed on Roke. Have wizards friends no more than they have wives or sons, I suppose. Once he said to me that in our trade, 
it's a lucky man who finds someone to talk to. Keep that in mind. If you're lucky, one day you'll have to open your mouth. Silence bowed his rough, thoughtful head. If it hasn't rusted shut, Dolce added. If you ask me to, I'll talk, the young man said, so earnest, so willing to deny his whole nature at Dulce's request, that the wizard had to laugh. I ask you not to, he said, and it's not my need I spoke of. I talk enough for two. Never mind, you'll know what to say when the time comes. That's the art, eh? What to say and when to say it, and the rest is silence. The young man slept on a pallet under the little west window of Dulce's house for three years. He learned wizardry, fed the chickens, milked the cow. He suggested once that dogs keep goats. He had not said anything for a week or so, a cold, wet week of autumn. He said, you might keep some goats. Dulce had the big law book open on the table. He had been trying to reweave one of the Akastan spells, much broken and made powerless by the emanations of Fundor centuries ago. He had just begun to get a sense of the missing word that might fill in one of the gaps. He almost had it and... You might keep some goats, Silence said. Dawes considered himself a wordy, impatient man with a short temper. The necessity of not swearing had been a burden to him in his youth. And for thirty years, the imbecility of prentices, clients, cows and chickens had tried him sorely. Prentices and clients were afraid of his tongue, though cows and chickens paid no attention to his outbursts. He had never been angry at silence before. There was a very long pause. What for? Silence, apparently, did not notice the pause or the extreme softness of Dulce's voice. Milk? Cheese? Roast kid? Company? He said. Have you ever kept goats? Dulce asked in the same soft, polite voice. Silence shook his head. He was, in fact, a town boy born in Gaunt Port. He had said nothing about himself, but Dulce had asked around a bit. The father, a longshoreman, had died in the big earthquake, when silence would have been seven or eight. The mother was a cook at the waterfront inn. At twelve, the boy had got into some kind of trouble, possibly messing about with magic, and his mother had managed to apprentice him to Alassan, a respectable sorcerer up in Valmouth. There the boy had picked up his true name, and some skill in carpentry and farm work, if not much else. And the lassen had had the generosity, after three years, to pay his passage to Rogue. That was all Dulce knew about him. I dislike goat cheese, Dulce said. Silence nodded, acceptant as always. From time to time in the years since then, Dulce remembered how he hadn't lost his temper when Silence asked about keeping goats. And each time the memory gave him a quiet satisfaction, like that of finishing the last bite of a perfectly ripe pear. After spending the next several days trying to recapture the missing word, he had set Silence to studying the Akastan spells. Together they finally worked it out, a long toil. Like ploughing with a blind ox, Dulce said. Not long after that, he gave Silence the staff he had made for him of Gontish Oak. And the Lord of Gontport had tried once again to get Dulce to come down to do what needed doing in Gontport. And Dulce had sent Silence down instead. And there he had stayed. And Dulce was standing on his own doorstep, three eggs in his hand and the cold rain running down his back. How long had he been standing here? Why was he standing here? He'd been thinking about mud, about the floor, about silence. Had he been walking out on the path above the overfell, 
No, that was years ago, years ago, in the sunlight. It was raining. He had fed the chickens and come back to the house with three eggs. They were still warm in his hand, silky brown, lukewarm eggs. And the sound of thunder was still in his mind. The vibration of thunder was in his bones, in his feet. Thunder? No, there had been a thunderclap a while ago. This was not thunder. He had had this queer feeling and had not recognised it, but when? Long ago, back before all the days and years he had been thinking of. When? When had it been? Before the earthquake. Just before the earthquake. Just before half a mile of the coast at Essary slumped into the sea and people died, crushed in the ruins of their villages. And a great wave swamped the wharfs at Gaunt Port. He stepped down from the doorstep onto the dirt so that he could feel the ground with the nerves of his souls. But the mud slimed and fouled any messages the dirt had for him. He set the eggs down on the doorstep sat down beside them, cleaned his feet with rainwater from the pot by the step, wiped them dry with the rag that hung on the handle of the pot, rinsed and wrung out the rag and hung it on the handle of the pot, picked up the eggs, stood up slowly and went into the house. He gave a sharp look at his staff which leaned in the corner behind the door. He put the eggs in the larder, ate an apple quickly because he was hungry and took up his staff. It was you bound at the foot with copper, worn to satin at the grip. Namel had given it to him. Stand, he said to it in its language, and let go of it. It stood as if he had driven it into a socket. To the root, he said impatiently in the language of the making. To the root. He watched the staff that stood on the shining floor. In a little while, he saw it quiver, very slightly, a shiver, a tremble. Ah, oh, said the old wizard. What should I do? He said aloud after a while. The staff swayed, was still, and shivered again. Enough of that, my dear doll said, laying his hand on it. Come on now. No wonder I keep thinking about silence. I should send for him. Send to him, no. What did Ard say? Find the centre, find the centre. That's the question to ask, that's what to do. As he muttered unto himself, rooting out his heavy cloak, he set water to boil on a small fire he had lit earlier. And he wondered if he had always talked to himself, if he had talked all the time when silence lived with him. No, it had become a habit after silence left, he thought, with the bit of his mind that went on thinking the ordinary thoughts of life, while the rest of it made preparations for terror and destruction. He hard-boiled the three new eggs and one already in the larder and put them into a pouch along with four apples and a bladder of resonated wine in case he had to stay out all night. He shrugged arthritically into his heavy cloak, took up his staff, told the fire to go out and left. He no longer kept a cow. He stood looking into the poultry yard considering. The fox had been visiting the orchard lately, but the chickens would have to forage if he stayed away. They must take their chances like everyone else. He opened their gate a little. Though the rain was no more than a misty drizzle now, they stayed hunched up under the henhouse eaves, disconsolate. The king had not crowed once this morning. Have you anything to tell me? Dolls asked them. Brown Booker, his favourite, shook herself and said her name a few times. The others said nothing. Well, take care. I saw the fox on the full moon night, Dolph said, and went on his way. As he walked, he thought, he thought hard. He recalled, he recalled all he could 
of matters his teacher had spoken of once only and long ago. Strange matters, so strange. He had never known if they were true wizardry or mere witchery, as they said on Rogue. Matters he had certainly never heard about on Rogue, nor had he ever spoke about them there, maybe fearing the masters would despise him for taking such things seriously, maybe knowing they would not understand them, because they were Gontish matters, truths of Gunt. They were not written even in Ard's law books that had come down from the great maid Ennis of Perigal. They were all word of mouth. They were home truths. If you need to read the mountain, his teacher had told him, go to the dark pond at the top of Samir's cow pasture. You can see the ways in from there. You need to find the centre. See where to go in. Go in? Dolce had whispered. What could you do from the outside? Dolce was silent for a long time and then said, How? Thus, an Ard's long arm stretched out and upward in the invocation of what Dolce would later know was a great spell of transforming. Ard spoke the words of the spell awry, as teachers of wizardry must do lest the spell operate. Dulce knew the trick of hearing them aright and remembering them. When Ard was done, Dulce had repeated the words in his mind in silence, half sketching the strange, awkward gestures that were part of them. All at once his hand stopped. But you can't undo this, he said aloud. Ard nodded. It's irrevocable. Dulce knew no transformation that was irrevocable, no spell that could not be unsaid, except the word of unbinding, which is only spoken once. But why? At need, Ard said. Dulce knew better than to ask for explanation. The need to speak such a spell could not come often. The chance of his ever having to use it was very slight. He let the terrible spell sink down into his mind and be hidden and layered over with a thousand useful or beautiful or enlightening majories and charms. All the laws and rules of Roke, all the wisdom of the books Ard had bequeathed him. Crude, monstrous, useless. It lay in the dark of his mind for sixty years. Like the cornerstone of an earlier forgotten house, down in the cellar of a mansion full of lights and treasures and children. The rain had ceased, though mist still hid the peak, and shreds of cloud drifted through the high forests. Though not a tireless walker like Sidence, who would have spent his life wandering in the forests of Gaunt Mountain if he could, Dulce had been born in Rayalbi and knew the roads and ways around it as part of himself. He took the shortcut at Rissy's well and came out before midday on Samir's high pasture, a level step on the mountainside. Below it, all in sunlight now, the farm building stood in the lee of a hill, across which a flock of sheep moved like a cloud shadow. Gaunt port in its bay, were hidden under the steep knotted hills that stood inland above the city. Dulce wandered about a bit before he found what he took to be the dark pond. It was small, half mud in reeds, with one vague boggy path to the water and no tracks on that but goat hoofs. The water was dark, though it lay out under the bright sky and far above the peat soils. Dulce followed the goat tracks, growling when his foot slipped in the mud and he wrenched his ankle to keep from falling. At the brink of the water he stood still. He stooped to rub his ankle. He listened. It was absolutely silent. No wind, no bird call, no distant lowing or bleating or call of voice as if all the island had gone still 
Not a fly buzzed. He looked at the dark water. It reflected nothing. Reluctant, he stepped forward, barefoot and bare-legged. He had rolled up his cloak into his pack an hour ago when the sun came out. Reeds brushed his legs. The mud was soft and sucking under his feet, full of tangling reed roots. He made no noise as he moved slowly out into the pool and the circles of ripples from his movement were slight and small. It was shallow for a long way, then his cautious foot felt no bottom and he paused. The water shivered. He felt it at first on his thighs, a lapping like the tickling touch of fur, and then he saw it, the trembling of the surface all over the pond, not the round ripples he made, which had already died away, but a ruffling, a roughening, a shudder again and again. Where? he whispered, and then he said the word aloud in the language all things understand that have no other language. There was the silence. Then a fish leapt from the black shaking water, a white grey fish to the length of his hand, and as it leapt it cried out in a small clear voice, in that same language, Yavid. The old wizard stood there. He recollected all he knew of the names of Gunt, brought all its slopes and cliffs and ravines into his mind. In a minute he saw where Yavid was. It was the place where the ridges parted, just inland from Gunt Port, deep in the knot of hills above the city. It was the place of the fault. An earthquake centred there could shake the city down, bringing avalanche and tidal wave, close the cliffs of the bay together like hands clapping. Dull shivered, shuddered all over like the water of the pool. He turned and made for the shore, hasty, careless where he set his feet, and not caring if he broke the silence by splashing and breathing hard. He slugged back up the path through the reeds till he reached dry ground and coarse grass, and heard the buzz of midges and crickets. He sat down then on the ground, hard, for his legs were shaking. It won't do, he said, talking to himself in hardick. And then he said, I can't do it. And then he said, I can't do it by myself. He was so distraught that when he made up his mind to call silence, he could not think of the opening of the spell, which he had known for sixty years. Then when he thought he had it, he began to speak of summoning instead. And the spell had begun to work before he realised what he was doing, and stopped and undid it word by word. He pulled up some grass and rubbed at the slimy mud on his feet and legs. It was not dry yet, and only smeared about on his skin. I hate mud, he whispered. Then he snapped his jaws and stopped trying to clean his legs. Dirt. Dirt, he said, gently patting the ground he sat on. Then, very slow, very careful, he began to speak the spell of calling. In a busy street leading down to the busy, busy wharfs of Gunt Port, the wizard Ogion stopped short. The ship's captain beside him walked on several steps and turned to see Ogion talking to the air. But I will come, master, he said. And then after a pause, how soon? And after a longer pause, he told the air something in a language the ship's captain did not understand and made a gesture that darkened the air about him for an instant. Captain, he said, I'm sorry, I must wait to spell your sails. An earthquake is near. I must warn the city. Do tell them down there. Every ship that can sail, make for the open sea. Clear out past the armed cliffs. Good luck to you. And he turned and ran back up the street, a tall, strong man with rough, greying hair, running now like a stag. Gunt Port lies at the inner end of a long, narrow bay between steep shores. Its entrance from the sea is between two great headlands, the gates of the port 
the armed cliffs, not a hundred feet apart. The people of Gompport are safe from sea pirates, but their safety is their danger. The long bay follows a fault in the earth, and jaws that have opened may shut. When he had done what he could to warn the city, and seen all the gate guards and port guards doing what they could to keep the few roads out from becoming choked and murderous with panicky people, Ogion shut himself into a room in the signal tower of the port, locked the door, for everybody wanted him at once, and sent ascending to the dark pond in Samir's cow pasture up on the mountain. His old master was sitting in the grass near the pond, eating an apple. Bits of eggshell flecked the ground near his feet, which were caked with drying mud. When he looked up and saw Ogi unsending, he smiled a wide, sweet smile. But he looked old. He had never looked so old. Ogion had not seen him for over a year, having been busy. He was always busy in Gumpport, doing the business of the lords and people, never a chance to walk in the forests on the mountainside, or to come and sit with Heleth in the little house at Rayalbi and listen and be still. Heleth was an old man, near eighty now, and he was frightened. He smiled with joy to see Ogion, but he was frightened. I think what we have to do, he said, without preamble, is try to hold the fault from slipping much. You at the gates and me at the inner end in the mountain, working together, you know, we might be able to. I can feel it building up, can you? Ogion shook his head. He let his sending sit down in the grass near her left though it did not bend the stems of the grass where it stepped or sat. I've done nothing but set the city in a panic and send the ships out the bay, he said. What is it you feel? How do you feel it? There were technical questions, mage to mage. Hilef hesitated before answering. I learned about this from Ard, he said, and paused again. He had never told Ogion anything about his first teacher, a sorcerer of no fame, even in guns, and perhaps of ill fame. Ogion knew only that Ard had never gone to Roke, had trained on Perigal, and that some mystery or shame darkened the name. Though he was talkative for a wizard, Heleth was silent as a stone about some things. And so Ogion, who respected silence, had never asked him about his teacher. It's not rogue magic, the old man said. His voice was dry, a little forced. Nothing against the balance, though. Nothing sticky. That had always been his word for evil doings, spells for gain, curses, black magic, sticky stuff. After a while, searching for the words, he went on. Dirt, rocks, it's dirty magic, old, very old, as old as Gaunt Island. The old powers, Ogion murmured. Heleth said, I'm not sure. Will it control the, the earth itself? More, more a matter of getting in with it, I think, inside. The old man was burying the core of his apple and the larger bits of eggshell under loose dirt, patting it over them neatly. Of course, I know the words, but I'll have to learn what to do as I go. That's the trouble with big spells, isn't it? You learn what you're doing while you do it. No chance to practice, he looked up. Ah, there you feel that? Ogion shook his head. Straining, Hilleth said his hands still absently, gently, patting the dirt as one might pat a scared cow. Quite soon now, I think. Can you hold the gates open, my dear? Tell me what you'll be doing. But her left was shaking his head. No, he said, no time, not your kind of thing. 
he was more and more distracted by whatever it was he sensed in the earth or the air, and through him, Ogion too felt that gathering intolerable tension. They sat unspeaking. The crisis passed. Heleth relaxed a little and even smiled. Very old stuff, he said, what I'll be doing. I wish now I'd thought about it more, passed it on to you, but it seemed a bit crude, heavy-handed. She didn't say where she'd learned it. Here, of course, there are different kinds of knowledge after all. She? Odd, my teacher. Heleth looked up, his face unreadable, its expression possibly sly. You didn't know that? No. I suppose I never mentioned it. I wonder what difference it made to her wizardry, her being a woman, or to mine, my being a man. What matters to me, it seems, is whose house we live in, and who we let enter the house, that kind of thing. There, there again. His sudden tension and immobility, the strained face and inward look, were like those of a woman in labour when her womb contracts. That was Ogion's thought, even as he asked. What did you mean, in the mountain? The spasm passed, Heleth answered. Inside it, there, at Yavid. He pointed to the knotted hills below them. I'll go in, try to keep things from sliding around, eh? I'll find out how, when I'm doing it, no doubt. I think you should be getting back to yourself. Things are tightening up. He stopped again, looking as if he were in intense pain, hunched and clenched. He struggled to stand up. Unthinking, Ogion held out his hand to help him. No use, said the old wizard, grinning. You're only wind and sunlight. Now I'm going to be dirt and stone. You'd best go on. Farewell, I how. Keep the... Keep the mouth open for once, eh? Ogion, obedient, bringing himself back to himself in the stuffy, tapestried room at Gaunt Port, did not understand the old man's joke until he turned to the window and saw the armed cliffs down at the end of the long bay, the jaws ready to snap shut. I will, he said, and set to it. What I have to do, you see, the old wizard said, still talking to silence, because it was a comfort to talk to him, even if he was no longer there. Is get into the mountain, right inside, but not the way a sort of a prospector does, no, not just slipping about between things and looking and tasting. Deeper, all the way in. Not the veins, but the bones. So, and standing there alone, in the high pasture, in the noon light, Heleth opened his arms wide in the gesture of invocation that opens all the greater spells and spoke. Nothing happened as he said the words Ard had taught him, his old witch teacher with her bitter mouth and her long lean arms. The words spoken awry then, spoken truly now. Nothing happened and he had time to regret the sunlight and the sea wind and to doubt the spell, to doubt himself before the earth rose up around him, dry, warm and dark. In there he knew he should hurry, that the bones of the earth ached to move and that he must become them to guide them. But he could not hurry. There was on him the bewilderment of any transformation he had in his day been a fox and a bull and a dragonfly and knew what it was to change being. But this was different, this slow enlargement. He reached out towards Yavid, towards the ache, the suffering. As he came closer to it, he felt a great strength flow into him from the west, as if silence had taken him by the hand after all. Through that link he sent his own strength, the mountain strength, to help. 
I didn't tell him I wasn't coming back, he thought. His last words in Hardik, his last grief, for he was in the bones of the mountain now. He knew the arteries of fire and the beat of the great heart. He knew what to do. It was in no tongue of man that he said, Be quiet. Be easy. There now there. Hold fast. So there. We can be easy. And he was easy. He was still. He held fast. Rock in rock. And earth in earth. In the fiery dark of the mountain. It was their mage, Ogion, whom the people saw stand alone on the roof of the signal tower on the wharf, when the streets ran up and down in waves, the cobbles bursting out of them, and walls of clay brick puffed into dust, and the armed cliffs leaned together groaning. It was Ogion they saw, his hands held out before him, straining, parting, and the cliffs parted with them, and stood straight unmoved. The city shuddered and stood still. It was Ogion who stopped the earthquake. They saw it, they said. My teacher was with me, and his teacher with him, Ogion said when they praised him. I could hold the gate open because he held the mountain still. They praised his modesty and did not listen to him. Listening is a rare gift and men will have their heroes. When the city was in order again, and the ships had all come back, and the walls were being rebuilt, Ogion escaped from the praise and went up into the hills above Gaunt Port. He found the queer little valley called Trimmer's Dell, the true name of which, in the language of the making, was Yavid, as Ogion's true name was Ihal. He walked about there all one day as if seeking something. In the evening he lay down on the ground and talked of it. You should have told me. I could have said goodbye, he said. He wept then, and his tears fell on the dry dirt among the grass stems <clears throat> and made little spots of mud, little sticky spots. He slept there on the ground with no pallet or blanket between him and the dirt. At sunrise he got up and walked the high road over to Rayalbi. He did not go into the village but passed it to the house that stood alone north of the other houses at the beginning of the overfell. The door stood open. The last beans had got big and coarse on the vines. The cabbages were thriving. Three hens came clucking and pecking around the dusty dooryard. A red, a brown, a white. A grey hen was setting her clutch in the hen house. There were no chicks and no sign of the cock, the king, Heleth had called him. The king is dead, Ogion thought. Maybe a chick is hatching even now to take his place. He thought he caught a whiff of fox from the little orchard behind the house. He swept out the dust and leaves that had blown in the open doorway across the floor of polished wood. He set Heleth's mattress and blanket in the air, in the sun. I'll stay here a while, he thought. It's a good house. After a while, he thought. I might keep some goats. So now I'd just like to share some reflections on some of the themes in that story. I've been thinking about where do we turn to for guidance and who do we turn to in times of crisis and times of upheaval um, where it's not, there's not just danger and threat but a demand of us to undertake transformative work. Um, and just questioning assumptions of what that work should look like um, and listening for where that work has already happened, who has already done that work and whether that work has been overlooked 
or ignored in the past or maybe been marginalised and just being mindful of who holds the knowledge of this work. So this has been 100 Stories Deep. I hope you've enjoyed listening. Bye-bye now.